it's lovely to be with you today. I can't tell you how what an honor it is to be at St. Thomas, a church for which I've always had huge admiration. Um, I was here 21 years ago preaching uh, because when I was vicar of Tewkesbury Abbey, the school choir attached to the abbey came on a tour and we sang the services here at St. Thomas and I had the honor of preaching then. So that's 21 years since I occupied your esteemed pulpit. So it's wonderful to be back. And our thoughts and prayers have very much been with Father Carl. Um, I've known Carl for many years because we were both presenters in English cathedrals, he at Exeter and me at, um, at Ely. And our paths, as is always the way in the church, paths crisscross and you suddenly see somebody who you knew years ago. Well, Carl suggested that it might be good to tell you a, a bit about my work for the last 20 years. Uh, all vicars, all deans have to do certain things without question. You have to obviously care for the people, celebrate the sacraments. Uh, you have to keep the church watertight, you know, all yes. those things. And you have to raise money. All those things are a given. But every vicar and every dean will have a specialty that will be in their heart. And I think that's important. For some, it'll be uh, care in the community, perhaps. For some, it'll be uh, their scholarship. And for me, I found that I was being called to help people to understand their heritage, which was in their midst, and to emphasize pilgrimage and the prayers of the saints. Because you see, these things have not always been understood in the Anglican tradition. And I felt that there was something which we could all learn together. So I've come today to tell you a bit about the background, and perhaps there may be some questions, because at the heart of it is the question, is what I've done loyal to the Reformation, or is it not? So that's the question that must be in your mind to challenge me at the end, if you think I've been disloyal to the tradition of the Reformation. It's too late now anyway. <laughs> anyway, so let's, let's get cracking. Um, you know, in, in New York, there are many shrines of the saints, and I've done a bit of homework on that. We were yet, at yesterday, we were at that little um, chapel down right at the bottom of Fifth Avenue at Battery Park, St. Elizabeth Seton, which is remarkable, really. Um, but, you know, you've got the shrine of St. Elizabeth Ann Seton. Um, in the Church of St. John the Baptist, you've got the relics and shrine of Padre Pio, who's now a saint, you know, who had the stigmata in his hands. And you've got the shrine of St. Francis Cabrini here in the city. And in the Church of the Most Holy Redeemer, you've got an amazing chapel which is full of the relics of the saints. But of course, they're all Roman Catholic. Okay? And you won't find, I don't think, any churches who follow that tradition. We're going back to England now, and of course, the shrines of the saints, where the saints were buried and venerated, were an absolutely vital part of medieval religion. People came from far and wide on pilgrimage to pray at the shrines and to leave their offerings and to be healed there. This is a, an artist's reconstruction of what perhaps it might have looked like in medieval times. And of course, there was color. And that's always been on my heart to bring back into churches color, which was often defaced, wasn't it, at the Reformation. So that was what we were looking at. And if we look round England at the time, we will see that nearly all the great churches had shrines of the saints. It, it gave focus to them, to their meaning. It gave them meaning. And so in Durham Cathedral, that great 
cathedral on the rock in the north of England. You've seen wonderful pictures of it. Uh, you had two shrines, the St Cuthbert and the Venerable Bede. And often pilgrims who'd come for miles to venerate would have been warned that the shrine was going to be exposed. Can you see how they're tugging on a rope and raising a canopy which should have been over the shrine? And of course, the most famous of all, St. Thomas Becket, murdered brutally in his cathedral in 1170. And his pilgrimage cult spread right across, not just England, but four, five years after his death, pilgrims were coming from Italy and, and further afield. And there we see one of the wonderful windows in Canterbury Cathedral celebrating this great saint. And he dominated the lives of, of medieval pilgrims. Of course, his shrine was completely defaced at the Reformation under the commissioners of Henry VIII. They had a particular, the king had a particular dislike for Becket because, of course, he was um, at odds with the then king, Henry II. And so he didn't have a good track record. So his shrine, where some survived, his most certainly didn't. And if you go to Canterbury Cathedral today, on the site of that shrine, which would have been covered in colour and jewels, you will see just a single candle. And somehow it's simpler and more meaningful for that. Shrines of the saints levelled king and commoner. They were all equal before God. And the lowliest could come to the shrine, or as in this case, the visit of King Henry VI to the shrine of St. Edmund at Bury St. Edmunds. There he is kneeling at the shrine. They often took that form with a base and with a tapered, like a, a house at the top. Pilgrims came to be healed. There are accounts of all sorts of healings going on, and they often left a, an offering when they'd been healed or in prayer for their healing, um, a shape in the shape of the part of the body that they hoped would be healed. And so here you see this chap who's holding up a wax leg. So presumably he had some leg ailment, and there's a face, a hand, and a heart. And these, they must have been very, very cluttered places because pilgrims left them and they just were left there to gather dust for years, I think. So that's in York Minster, the Shrine of William. Well, at the Reformation, the shrines were dismantled. Their treasures, went into the king's coffers, and they were often cruelly defaced. Um, it seems awful to us that something of beauty should be defaced. Luther never did it, of course. Um, in his German Reformation, he saw the beauty of um, images and paintings, stained glass. But the English Reformation was more influenced by Calvin and Geneva. And so in the reign of, you know, the end of the reign of Henry VIII, and certainly in his son, Edward VI, uh, there was no time at all. And so they were defaced cruelly. Some survived um, in part. This is the shrine of St. Werburgh at Chester Cathedral, which after the Reformation, was converted into the bishop's throne. Handy. And I think that's his wife hanging around at the bottom of the stairs, waiting for his lordship to appear in the throne. So that one survived. Uh, go fast forward to the 19th century. The Roman Catholics are now coming back to worship in the country. They were allowed to worship from 1829, and from 1850, the hierarchy of bishops was restored. And often they set up shrines rival, if you like, 
in the shadow of the great cathedrals as if to say, well, you're not doing it, so we will. And so if you go to Canterbury, there's a little church not far away from the great cathedral, which is the Catholic church, and in it, they have a shrine of St. Thomas of Canterbury. And you can see the little cabinet above, which has relics of the saint in it. And you'll see that happen in quite a few, like Ely with St. Ethelreda and Salisbury with St. Osmond. The Catholics, the Roman Catholics, took on that mantle, if you like. And most gloriously of all, they did that at the Pugin Cathedral, St. Chad's Cathedral in Birmingham, where Pugin created the most magnificent shrine to contain the relics of St. Chad, the great cathedral of the Midlands, of Mercia. The, the, the Anglicans scratched their heads and said, hmm, what shall we do about our heritage? It's a great heritage of the saints, but we don't want to go down the line of pilgrimage and relics. That's just too much to swallow. What shall we do? And so they just put images in discreetly, nothing to upset the apple cart. And so if you go to Litchfield Cathedral, you'll see lots and lots of images of St. Chad, but in the floor, in marble. And if you look up, you'll see him on a wall. So there's lots of statues. He's come back, but, you know, gently, <laughs> as befits Anglicanism. And, or embroidery. It was all right in embroidery. So here's one of my cathedral, Hereford, to celebrate the founding of the diocese in, listen to this, 676. What do you think of that, AD? So that was the celebration of, the, there he is. Now, a big step forward was made in 1872, when St. Albans became a cathedral, a huge church. It had been an abbey church before the Ref Reformation, then it became a parish church of the town. Then when the diocese was created uh, in the 1870s, they had to do a, a lot of restoration work, and they found the fragments of the medieval shrine. There they are, all laid out on trestle tables, like a jigsaw puzzle. Oops. And they were pieced together. And so, lo and behold, one of the medieval shrines came back into use. There it is, as it was in the 1880s. But the Church of England was changing. You had the Oxford movement, of course, and with it came more devotion, more reverence, more beauty more color in worship. And this took on a terrific turn in the 1920s, when the Anglo-Catholic movement really took hold. This is the kind of altar that the Anglo-Catholics had in mind. Simple, isn't it? So in the 1920s and 30s, you had a strain of thought in the Church of England which said, I think we need to be much closer to the Roman Catholics. And what better way than to adorn our churches in that way? So I'm thinking of some of the churches. Of course, St. Thomas is very Catholic, but it's in an Anglican way. But I'm sure there are churches in New York, like St. Mary the Virgin. That's a bit more like this, isn't it? I think. there was a priest called Father Arthur Tooth. And he was at the vanguard of this, to bring back beauty and ritual into the services. Disraeli's government had brought in an act forbidding this and persecuting priests who dared to put two candles on the altar, something which we take for granted now, but it wasn't taken for granted. And he ended up a martyr because, of course, he went to prison for doing these things. But he was also extremely wealthy. 
And when he came out of prison, he hatched a plan aided by the great Lord Halifax, who also had big money. And they said they wanted to restore the shrine at Canterbury Cathedral. Well, that was incendiary because Canterbury Cathedral, of course, is the mother church of the Anglican Communion. And they thought if Canterbury Cathedral can lead the way, surely it will say great things about how the Church of England is progressing. And so they employed an architect, Zaninian Comper, to design a shrine. The chapter said they wanted something discreet and sober. What they ended up with this design was 16 foot tall, 12 foot long, and 12 foot wide. It failed. And Lord Halifax was furious. And in the press, he castigated the chapter and told them what stupid men they were. But in other ways, the Church of England was changing. Um, and St. Thomas is a great example of that, isn't it? Of using beauty in worship. This is uh, the Easter Vigil at Hereford Cathedral. And this would be reflected in so many cathedrals throughout England and in the Anglican Communion, where there are vestments, candles, the crucifix, all the ceremonies which we've come to take for granted, which were not always there. Cathedrals also in England changed dramatically in the last, I don't know, 40, 50 years, because they embraced commercialism, not for its own sake, I think, but because pilgrims have always wanted to take something back from the journey, um, a souvenir, um, a pilgrim's badge, something which reminded them of a spiritual experience. And that's how cathedral shops really started to enable people to take something back from their visit. Of course, they proliferated into great enterprises now, selling teddy bears and all sorts of things which you might think don't quite come into the realm of religious um, remembrances, but no matter, they give a, a sense of welcome and embrace people, as do cafes. I mean, it's a, it, it's a great thing now that when you go to uh, a cathedral or a big church that there's hospitality. And that goes, of course, right back to the Benedictine idea of hospitality, that you welcome pilgrims and gave them food and drink. Cathedrals don't give people food and drink, uh, they charge them for it. But, but the thought is there. And it's an, it's an, <laughs> it's an important. So, so you, you see what I mean? So can you see that gradually, uh, an atmosphere is opening up of welcoming people who are not actually paid up members of the congregation, but they're pilgrims. All this was given quite a push in the 1930s by the development of the Shrine of Our Lady of Walsingham uh, by the then vicar, Father Hope Patton, and he developed uh, the whole concept of pilgrimage and devotion to the saints, especially to Our Lady. And in the 1990s, gradually, shrines were really restored to their former glory. Here's, do you remember that one of St. Albans? There it was rather bare. And now it is today with the canopy on the top. It's a, it's a beautiful addition. And it, it draws pilgrims together. Uh, Westminster Abbey, that was the only shrine that didn't have any destruction at all. Why? Because it contained the body of a king. And for all his faults, Henry VIII was not going to touch the tomb 
of one of his predecessors. So it's the only shrine to remain intact almost. And there you can see part of the pilgrimage going on at the shrine behind the high altar in Westminster Abbey. That's the area, of course, of the abbey where the king uh, vested uh, during the coronation service. Remember the bishop's throne with uh, Mrs. Bishop hanging around at the bottom? Well, there it is today, focus of prayer. And St. David's in Wales, that's been beautifully restored. Can you see its colour? Medieval churches were full of colour. They were like fairgrounds, really, so bright and vivid and in your face. And I think shrines have an opportunity to bring back that colour. Well, now, we're on to the place I know best, which is Hereford. Now, Hereford, amazingly, the shrine base escaped. I think partly it was because Hereford is so far away from London, uh, a tiny little city. Uh, people kind of forgot about it. And so it survived. Here's a, a 17th century man going around the country sketching, and he made a sketch of it as it was in 1680, and that's how it was. They tried to uh, make it more relevant in 1970 uh, by putting this, th um, can you see it? The vergers at the time called it the toast rack. Um, it, it, it's a kind of grid which lit up and it was meant to give an idea of sanctity. Um, I think it was a bit of a flop, <laughs> but I would say that. In 1995, the shrine was completely dismantled and there was an archaeological um, research done on it. And here are some of the pictures of it. And when it was completely restored, it looked like that. Now, my predecessor, Dean Robert Willis, who went on to become, I'm sure some of you have met him when he's been preaching here, uh, but he went on to be Dean of Hereford and Canterbury. And when he was at Hereford, he presided over the restoration. And it was left like this. I think we could say that Dean Willis was a, a minimalist. I, on the other hand, am a maximalist. Uh, that's what we did with it. And you can see the colour, um, the canopy, the kneelers for people to kneel and say their prayers, candles around it, and on either side, hangings telling the story of this medieval saint. And within you can just about glimpse there is a relic uh, of the saint. Which bit, I'm not sure but it doesn't matter. Relics of the saints, although we may find it not quite to our taste, they remind us that the saints were human beings of flesh and blood like you and me. And that humanity is somehow encapsulated in a relic of them. We all have relics. You have relics of your those you love, photographs or lockets, Things like that, they're relics, they're important because they remind you of the humanity of somebody who you love dearly. And if we love the saints dearly, uh, then we want to honour uh, their physical presence. This is the skull of Thomas Cantaloupe, which amazingly survived. Um, it was in the care of the Roman Catholic uh, Abbey at Downside. And in our celebration year, 2020, which was 700 years since he was declared a saint, the Abbey said, you may borrow it for a year. And so we did. And it created great interest uh, 
as a, as a reminder of the humanity of the saints, very much so. He's gone back now. Is he martyred? He wasn't. No, Thomas of Hereford was um, Bishop of Hereford from 1275, 1282. But he was persecuted by the Bishop of, of the Archbishop of Canterbury, and he went to Rome to plead his case before the Pope. He died there. His body was brought back. And at his shrine, uh, in the next few years, 400 miracles were reported, second only to what we call the other Thomas, Thomas of Canterbury, where 600 miracles um, are recorded. So not that I'm counting, I'm just saying, uh, but the, the, the relics remained cared for by Roman Catholic communities. But this one too was his tibia. I think that's here, isn't it? Tiny, really. He must have been a very tiny man. Is it? Is it right? Or that, oh, do you know? I've been telling people it's there. Thank you so much for uh, female. For, for, yes. Right, female. Okay. So, in, in a rather beautiful reliquary by the nineteenth-century um, craftsman Harden. But it's not about just bringing colour back or making inroads into the devotion to relics. It's about people, and it draws people. Colour draws people. And so we had lots more visitors to, to the cathedral and the shrine. Here's one group that came. And we found that it was a place of healing. It always was. But there was a prayer board next to the shrine. And people could leave their prayers there for Margaret dying of cancer, for my beloved son, John, who I remember every day of my life. People would put prayers in there and light a candle. And they would come seeking healing. Who can tell if the healings were as dramatic as they were reported to be in the Middle Ages? We don't know. But healing isn't always of the body, it's of the soul and of the spirit. Um, I've known people who've been healed in body, but they're not healed wholly. And the same is true of people who are about to die and yet they have been healed because they've made their peace. So healing is a very broad thing. Uh, again, it helps people to remember their visit with pilgrim badges. This is one we had specially designed for the, the celebration of the 700th anniversary of the canonization, the making of a saint of St. Thomas in 1320. There was an icon painting course to enable people to understand how important icons are. You've got some lovely icons here at St. Thomas, and they're not just things of color, they're things to be prayed, to help you to pray, as you realize that they, the works themselves were painted or written with prayer. We had another saint, too, not content with just one. We had another one who was a Saxon saint. He was martyred in 794 by King Offa of Mercia. Um, and his shrine was destroyed, along with all the rest. There was nothing remaining at all. So he said, I think we should try and recreate this in the cathedral. So we had one designed, and here's Peter Murphy who made it, who's putting finishing touches to it. And there it is today. It provides a great focus of prayer. On the feast day, there are flowers. We process to the shrine to say our prayers there. And again, 
It's got 13 panels around it, which tell the story of his life. I won't go into them now, but it's a, an adventure story and a story of great hope and triumph. And there it is for those who come to pray at the shrine. We instituted an order of St. Ethelbert. Uh, th these are people who have often given hugely to their churches throughout the diocese. People who've been church wardens for 50 years, organists for 40 years, cleaning the church and doing the churchyard for 30 years, people who've been on the church council and have given uh, their lives really to the church. So they were honored and we decided to name the honor for him. Uh, the Queen visited in 2012 to open the new cathedral close, and we had a papier-mâché figure of St. Ethelbert. He was a king. There he is, and 12 foot high. And there's me showing the Queen. The Queen said, what's he made of? I said, he's papier-mâché, ma'am. She said, I do hope he survives. <laughs> she had a wonderful sense of humor. There was a well. Pilgrims came to that to be healed, especially of eye um, ailments. He was famous for the healing of the eyes. And the children would gather on St. Ethelbert's Day in May, and often dress up as the king. No reenacting of the beheading, of course. We had pilgrimages. He was martyred at uh, a church about five miles outside Hereford, Hereford called Marden. And each year we would gather at Marden, and young and old would make the pilgrimage, the five miles, into the cathedral saying prayers en route, and it, it kind of opened up people to, to their prayer and to his prayer. Um, okay. There was a fair going back to the Middle Ages, uh, which always happened in May. It was two or three days, and the bishop and the dean always um, took part in the opening of the fair. And when the fair was opened, we always had a free ride. Um, and the bishop and I used to go on the on the wheel, you know, the whatever you call it, Ferris wheel. Um, and this picture was taken and submitted to the Church Times, which used to ha has a competition, uh, the captions, you know, people with a picture and in these wise guys give, you know, their view of what is being said. Well, the winning caption for this, I'm Michael, and the then bishop was Richard. And somebody had got the caption, Rick and Mick being sick. <laughs> but remembrances go on. And it's not a thing of the past, it's a thing of the present. And shrines are not just a, a resuscitation of the past, there's something for the present. And we had the privilege yesterday of visiting that amazing memorial. I was here, you know, the April after 9-11, preaching here. And you know, New York was, was a terrible place, wasn't it? It was awful, um, you know, the, the sadness. But there was a great feeling of hope, I thought, there. And I guess that people go there on pilgrimage, don't they? To find hope and to get some answer to... Because, you see, the questions that pilgrims in the Middle Ages were grappling with are just the same today. They went to the shrines to answer the questions which couldn't really be answered, like... Why is life so unfair? Why is there pain? Why is there suffering? Um, what can I do to alleviate it in some way? And they found comfort. And it's exactly the same today. The questions haven't changed. 
uh, in life, and we find comfort by going to these places. And that amazing um, orthodox shrine there. And you have your own shrine. They're important. They're focuses of prayer. You have the shrine of Our Lady, and you have the shrine of remembrance, and all these things are places where we can find peace and have our prayer life developed and enriched. 